There we go. There. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is David DePlessy, and I'm the CEO of the St. John Region Chamber of Commerce. I would like to welcome everyone to our political leadership series leading up to the provincial election this Monday. Now, in this session, we will hear from Mr. Kevin Vickers, who is a leader of New Brunswick Liberal Party. This business-focused series is being hosted by the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce, the St. John Region Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber of Commerce for Greater Moncton, Ignite Fredericton, Economic Development Greater St. John, and 3 Plus in Moncton. Thank you as well to the Atlantic Chamber of Commerce for their support. Now in the chat box, you'll see the links to a pair of letters that have been sent to all party leaders on behalf of the business community. Uh, before we begin, I want to explain the format and the process to begin. Mr. Vickers will give an opening presentation, which will be followed by a Q&A session. Due to the number of registrants, the audience is muted, and so please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions, which will be asked by a moderator today. And today's moderator is Mr. John Wishart, the CEO of the Greater Moncton Chamber of Commerce. The moderator will ask as many questions as possible and will prioritize business-focused questions and may combine submitted questions on the same or similar topics. And finally, the session is being recorded and will be posted and shared as soon as possible. Be sure to check out our social media feeds. Now with that, I'd like to hand the floor over to you, Mr. Vickers. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Merci pour votre belle invitation. These are difficult and unprecedented times for New Brunswick. I understand the profound impact this global pandemic has on all of us, especially on local businesses. New Brunswick has been able to partially open its economy quicker than some jurisdictions. However, we are a long way from being back to where we were before the crisis. And we know that those uh, enterprises that are open, many are just partially open. Labor figures from Stats Canada in August showed 16,000 fewer New Brunswickers working in full-time jobs in January. Certain sec sectors such as tourism and hospitality have been devastated. Prior to the pandemic, the Higgs government slashed the tourism budget by 40% despite this potential. They also threw out, threw out a comprehensive tourism strategy built in partnership with industry and failed to come up with a new one as promised. We will restore funding to the Department of Tourism cut by the Higgs government and restore the tourism growth strategy and the target to grow the tourism sector in the province into a $2 billion uh, industry revenue. And you, you should know that in Nova Scotia, th their revenue target is $2 billion higher, $4 billion. To help this industry, we will implement a wholesale pricing policy for restaurants and bars for liquor purchases from NB Liquor. The Higgs and government has invested less than any province in the, ec in the economic recovery, and as a result, we may see a higher percentage of businesses fail. We understand the importance of our business for the economy of our province. That is why we will create a COVID-19 economic recovery task force to put in place a short, medium, and long-term action plan with a report to be completed within 30 days. Working together with our businesses will help the economy recover more quickly. My opponent is all about cuts and austerities, but what New Brunswick really needs is a growth agenda. To pay for the services we need, the provinces needs to generate revenue, and the best way to do that is through economic growth. Prior to the pandemic, shut down, our economic growth rate ranked among the worst in Canada. That must change. It is critical that we support our businesses and individuals in recovering from the economic impact of COVID-19. We must also look beyond that. We need to grow our economy and our population together. That means listening to and working with the leaders of our business communities. It means building on our traditional industries and economic strengths. It also means aggressively pursuing new ideas and opportunities to help build a new economy for New Brunswick. One of the biggest barriers to growth is a shortage of skilled labor in a wide variety of sectors. We need to work together now to address this and make it a top priority for the provincial government. We will work with industry and post-secondary education institutions to identify labor shortages and develop an aggressive plan with established timelines to address these shortages. 
A Liberal government will also establish an aggressive target of population growth of 100,000 people in New Brunswick by 2030. Growing our population will help address the labour shortage in various job sectors. To reach this target, we will work together with the federal government in order to make immigration to New Brunswick a priority. We will make the case that we need to increase our quota of immigrants through a targeted approach to finding newcomers to fit specific job sectors. And a Liberal government will renew the Atlantic Pilot Program in order to attract more skilled foreign workers and international graduates. I want to transform our economy. I want to bring New Brunswickers together and I want to make targeted investments in order to grow our economy and our population. We will aggressively pursue new ideas and opportunities to build a new economy for New Brunswick in sectors like technology and cybersecurity. Cybersecurity was identified several years ago as a great economic opportunity for New Brunswick. Several companies in the province showed success on an international stage, helping build a cluster of expertise in the province. Efforts to grow this sector have stalled under the Higgs government. When elected, a Liberal government with strong candidates like Steve Burns of Ormocto Lincoln will aggressively pursue the opportunity to further develop cybersecurity and IT sectors as one of the cornerstones of a new economic growth in the province. The investment tax credit program is a good way to generate business growth and investment in New Brunswick companies. We believe enhancing this program will generate more investment and growth in New Brunswick. We will enhance the investment tax credit program in targeted sectors. We will also invest in the green economy. The development of small modular reactors as a new clean and reliable energy source represents a generational economic and job creation opportunity for New Brunswick. This is once, once in a generation opportunity. We will partner with the federal government in securing SMR opportunities for our province. And we'll build on our traditional industries like forestry, agriculture, and fisheries in order to ensure sustainable uh, development of our resources. A Liberal government will work towards creating favorable conditions for our businesses. The New Brunswick economy is driven by exports. Our businesses are well positioned to greater benefit from all signed free trade agreements. Working together with our exporters and businesses leaders, a Liberal government will develop an aggressive trade strategy to increase our exports. Our pledge to work together with others extends beyond our borders. A Liberal government will work more cooperatively with our Atlantic provinces and where possible, harmonization of regulations, accreditation and certification will be pursued. The Liberal Party is the only party with a clear vision for our province. We believe it's important to bring the books into balance as soon as possible. To do this, we will look for operational efficiencies while growing revenue through a more robust economy. A guiding principle will be to lever leverage our dollars with the federal government, municipalities, and the private sector. We will introduce a balanced budget by no later than the third year of our mandate. Budget surpluses will be applied to both provincial debt and priority programs. Blaine Higgs has shown that he doesn't understand the need of the Franklin community. He canceled important projects like the refurbishment of the Centennial Building, including a new courthouse. The project would have saved taxpayers $2.5 million a year in government rents. And even though the project was well underway, it was canceled by the Higgs government once it took power. That decision cost the Higgs government $11 million in cancellation fees. Canceling this project made no sense. Yes, there was an initial cost, but overall the government would have easily recouped those costs and saved money in the long term. The project would have created more office space downtown for provincial government employees, cut travel costs, and increased government productivity. It also included space for a much needed new courthouse in Fredericton. Currently, the building is fenced off, half completed, creating an eyesore in the downtown Fredericton. That's unacceptable. This was a political decision that looked only at the short term. They made a conscious decision to cost taxpayers money in the long term. We deserve better than that. I would love to be able to commit to you that we will restore the Centennial Building, but the property is supposedly been sold to a private developer. 
Yet the property does not seem to have been transferred. The city deserves to be updated on the stays of on the state of this matter. What I can commit to is the building of a new Fredericton Justice Complex to replace the current outdated facilities. I understand that the last six months have been especially difficult for our business around New Brunswick. Over 99% of New Brunswick businesses are small, medium enterprise, and we recognize the value of each and every one of our entrepreneurs who contribute to the economy of our province. By working together, we can restore hope and bring opportunities to every corner of our beautiful province. Those are my opening remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vickers. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is John Wishart. I'm the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce for Greater Moncton. And it's my uh, pleasure today to act as the moderator of the Q&A portion of today's session. So it is uh, now time for those questions. Please uh, use the chat button at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you'd like to pose a question. Uh, C'est maintenant le temps pour les questions et réponses. Veuillez cliquer sur le bouton chat si vous souhaitez poser une question. Um, I'm going to start off, Mr. Vickers, with a, a question of my own, and you referenced it in your, your opening remarks. You said you will, you will not uh, raise taxes, but you plan to balance the budget by 2023. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you will accomplish this? Certainly, you know, um, just so a little way of background, at, at the House of Commons, I had 1,200 employees, a budget of $59 million. Um, so the budgeting process and, and practices is something that I've been used to, but, you know, there's first um, step, I think, I'm really going to promote innovation and innovative practices and thinking within the public service. And I will be rewarding public servants who've come up with smarter ways of doing things and come up with doing things better. You know, just let me give you one small example. Uh, um, at the House of Commons, we managed over 10,000, 10,000 mobile devices across the country. We had a deficit in that area of $1.8 million. We brought all the phone companies in. We said, look, it, we don't want your family plan, we don't want your weekend plan, we don't want your evening plan, we want a House of Commons plan, and this is what we want. And all the phone companies put a tender in, and we took that $1.8 million deficit and made it a $1.2 million surplus. So when I talk about innovative practices, I know uh, with uh, bright thinking, gifted public employees, there's all kinds of savings, as just like the example I gave you uh, on that. The other thing I'm gonna do is all the ministers will be receiving mandate letters. And those mandate letters will be very specific as to regards to their envelope of money. But another practice of mine in the past as well is bringing deputy ministers together. And what traditionally happens in government, if one department gets an envelope of money, that's my money and they spend it. But what I'm going to ensure each and every month, deputy ministers meet, we'll review priorities and that money will be spent on priorities versus uh, uh, staying in one given government department for the spending for spending's sake. You've all heard of March Madness and governments going out and spending whatever's left in their, their envelopes before the thing. So there's all kinds of, of areas. But more importantly, uh, you know, I talk about the growth uh, agenda and I'm going to put ONB on steroids. And let me say that again. I'm going to put ONB on steroids. We have to be much more aggressive and robust identifying companies around the world to come to New Brunswick. And at the same time, we need to ensure that we have active, uh, uh, robust efforts to promote our existing companies in our province and finding markets for them. And I'm confident uh, if we have a strategic and robust, aggressive uh, plan to go out and knock on doors around the world, and I can give you further examples of this as, as we go on, that we can attract and bring companies here. One of our forces is, you know, we're an officially bilingual province. There are over 300 million people in the world who belong to the Francophonie. If we just had a target of 1% of the Francophonie around the world, just 1%, you know, it'd be, you know, we're talking millions of, of people coming uh, here to, to New Brunswick and tourism and all, all, all those sectors. But so growth, transforming the economy, being aggressive and 
getting, getting ourselves out there and attracting companies. And attracting companies, and you're talking about raising taxes, my mind is in the opposite space, is lowering taxes. We see Jason Kenney out in, out in Alberta. He's, he's lowered corporate taxes on path to 8%. And that's to me what you know we have to get down there so that companies will find New Brunswick an attractive place to come. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, our next question comes from uh, Jamie Ryan at the New Brunswick Real Estate uh, Association. And Jamie plans on asking this question to all five party leaders. And it relates to uh, what they see, and I think a lot of business owners see as unfair aspects of the current property tax system and how that also plays into lo local government structure. How would you uh, revise or update uh, the unfair aspects of the property tax system? Well, you know, I think one of the things that we got to track away from is this, you know, we all know the, the double taxation that, you know, to me discourages investment, discourages uh, the lack of investment and in, certainly into, uh, you know, rental properties and, and uh, the like. So we really have to do that. but. I think tax in general, uh, from what I'm hearing and what I see, there's, I think there's an appetite out there to think of reforming tax uh, in all areas and property tax. You know, I was down to St. John yesterday and I'm also committed to ensuring that uh, industrial tax in our major centers, such as St. John, and Edmonston, uh, Nakawick, um, up in uh, Kedgwick, um, you know, we have some major industries and, you know, we see cities struggling uh, with their budgets. So I'm sure that we can uh, do that a lot smarter than we are as well. So, so having, so cities like St. John and, and uh, you know, these cities with uh, heavy, heavy industry tax base that uh, they have the wherewithal to, to manage their budgets within the city. Would, would a liberal government commit to uh, ending the double taxation? Yeah, I'm, you know, obviously, I think we have to be pragmatic about these things. I don't think you can, you know, do this overnight. But my whole concentration, my whole focus is on growing the economy, growing revenues. I've, I find that's the way we're going to get ourselves out of where we are today. And to get ourselves to a more productive place, we've got to think of growth and we've got to think of investment. Um, so uh, the less we can do uh, and make ourselves more attractive. Um, and, you know, I, I, I keep saying I'm going to put a license plate on the province of New Brunswick. I'm going to call it the province of economic opportunity. And whatever we can do to deregulate, whatever we can do to lower taxes, to attract business and grow the economy, that's the direction I want to go. And so the double tax, absolutely, uh, we got to find a way pr pragmatically to get ourselves uh, weaned off that. Part of your uh, party's plan is to direct health authorities that no rural hospital will be closed and no emergency room services will be eliminated. Uh, the province's doctors are, are on the call today and they're wondering how and where you're going to invest in health care. Yeah, you know, and I'm glad we have a business audience here because when we talk about those rural hospitals, we never talk about economic development. You know, our communities, you know, like Sackville and, you know, Perth Andover, um, those rural hospitals, community hospitals, provide a very vital service to their communities. There's no question about that. Health and safety, uh, you know, those are all important. But for me, uh, as leader of the Liberal Party and hopefully Premier, I see those rural communities as a vital economic development piece for our province and for our, especially those communities. Because I know people will not go to those communities. We will not get population increase in our province in those communities if they don't have a hospital to go to we will not attract companies to those communities and investment in those communities unless they have services available available uh, to them so um, i see again you know uh, my focus is strategy is growing the economy investment and uh, keeping these hospitals open for for me they're an economic uh, development cornerstone for those communities. And I was down to Sackville, you know, and I've met so many seniors that transferred out of, uh, from out of province. And their only reason they went to Sackville, they wanted a small time environment, but it was critical to them that they had a rural community hospital there that provided emergency services. So uh, that's where my thinking is on that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Larry Shaw from Ignite Fredericton is asking about your party's innovation agenda. Innovation is one of those buzzwords that's been bandied around in campaigns for at least 30 years. And you talked about cybersecurity and digital health. Can you flesh out a little bit more what a liberal innovation agenda would look like? Yeah, again, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to my uh, previous comments of, you know, uh, an OMB or a, another, uh, but however we're going to configure this, and I keep using that term, putting them on steroids, uh, getting them out there, attracting investment, attracting companies uh, to uh, New Brunswick, you know, in the technology field, we know we had a really good thing going in Fredericton. Uh, we had a good uh, cybersecurity footprint. Uh, we had a lot of startups. It was exciting. And I want to put the step back in Fredericton's walk. I want to put Fredericton back on the map again uh, with, with, with technology. Did you know that there's going to be 3 million jobs worldwide by 2024? 3 million jobs worldwide by 2024 uh, created in cybersecurity. We've got to go out and, and get a piece of this, but you know, it, it, it's, it's leadership and it's that focus on economic development. Uh, you know, when I was in Ireland, uh, they went off an economic cliff, the, the country was bankrupt. They decided to focus on three emerging trending sectors. Uh, theirs was pharmaceutical, social media and technology. But then they went to the school, the, you know, the country's education system and, you know, Trinity College put her hands up and they were the first college to do a master's in artificial intelligence. And it's that type of bold initiative and bold thinking that I believe we can. And UNB, uh, look at, you know, <laughs> we're blessed there with incredible professors. We have world-class uh, cybersecurity people there and engineering. And Paul Muserall, um, you know, I'm excited uh, that he's there for their province because I know he's going to be aggressive and he's going to want to partner in these types of initiatives. Okay, there's a this question in the chat on tourism. And as I'm sure you're aware, the tourism sector was among the first and the hardest hit uh, due to COVID-19. And many operators are, are barely surviving the summer season. And those, those restaurants in particular, when the patios closed, they may be hard pressed to make ends meet with 50% occupancy. What's the liberal plan to help the tourism sector? Look at, we, <laughs> we have to work with the federal government and access uh, dollars that are on the table uh, to help our small, medium-sized enterprises, but especially, especially in tourism. Tourism to me is like uh, such a, you know, a golden opportunity for our province. And why on earth, <laughs> it makes absolutely no sense to me, they would have stripped uh, that budget from the Ministry of Tourism from 21.8 million down to 12, and so it was 40% cut in tourism, um, to me, it's like cutting your nose off to spite your face. Um, so we really have to gear it up. You know, <laughs> I was just mentioned there in my opening remarks, Nova Scotia, the government of Nova Scotia has an aspirational goal of $4 billion in tourism re revenue by 2024, 4 billion. Last year, before the pandemic, they were up to 2.3, uh, our $2.4 billion in revenue, we were at 1.3. Just about double, uh, Nova Scotia was just about double what we were bringing in revenues. And again, I talked about the francophonie. Il y a 300 million de personnes qui font partie de la francophonie partout au monde. There's over 300 million people uh, in the francophonie around the world. We're an official bilingual province, but who has the strategy targeting and uh, the Francophone community, community around the world, Nova Scotia. So we really got to up our game uh, and, and bring those tourists here. Uh, you know, we we're gonna to have to talk about that difficult question of looking at some point of going to one airport so we can get international flights in here. But again, in particular, uh, going back to your question with regards to the small restaurant and, and tourist operators, we have to give them that support and I will do whatever it takes to support uh, those, those companies by working with the federal government and whatever program money is there available uh, to them, we'll use. Um, you know, I know we're in an election, but you know, New Brunswick on a per capita basis of all the provinces of Canada help support our small business people and our economy, we've done the our province has done the least during this whole pandemic. And there's 
you know, we, we've seen all kinds of other provinces coming up with unique programs to help uh, restaurant tourism operators with rent, uh, delays of, uh, of uh, tax, uh, giving them grants up to five thousand uh, dollars. There's a whole plethora of programs that were helping other things that that didn't exist here in New Brunswick, and we've we've got to we've got to grab onto that and and uh, help our tourism and uh, restaurant operators. One of our uh, St. John participants uh, this morning has asked about a, a commitment that uh, apparently one of your candidates made in St. John to return eight to nine million dollars in tax revenue to the city to help uh, the city with its financial challenges. Is that a, a liberal government commitment to St. John? Yes, it's, it's in our platform. Um, the industrial tax is about eight million dollars in St. John. Um, Edmonston, uh, Nakawick, Athelville are other places where there's a large uh, industrial tax base. But we have to do this again and uh, pragmatically and and ensuring that other municipalities and local service districts that their budgets aren't hit. So uh, we're going to realign, we're going to look that, but my commitment is to these major cities and, and towns, I guess, uh, Nakawick, Edmondson, Athelville, and St. John is the, to sit down and, and try to uh, come up with a formula within government where they can keep uh, their industrial tax base monies. Mm -hmm. You made reference, uh, Mr. Vickers, to uh, regional collaboration across Atlantic Canada. And that's been a long held frustration for a lot of business owners is being able just to operate within the four Atlantic provinces. What areas of opportunity would a, a liberal government focus on in the region to make it easier to do business across the region? Well, you know, one of the things that I, that I really see, you know, we, we have these borders and, you know, we have great free trade agreements uh, with other countries. Uh, well, Europe, we just last year signed uh, the Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement, CETA, uh, where our country seen a strong, you know, astronomical benefit by taking down barriers and, and opening up trade. And that to me is key here. And what we seem to be gridlock in our own country where we uh, have these barriers on, you know, all the different goods and products, liquor, uh, all these uh, other uh, commodities, uh, different taxation rates. Look, at, we got to think about taking down the borders, taking down the trade barriers, opening ourselves up and opening up. And I, I have every confidence that New Brunswick business people are just as confident as anybody else. And uh, to have protection and protective policies, I, in my mind and my thinking, it's just degrees of losing. Uh, Valerie asks about your your reference to developing the economy by expanding the skills of workers. Uh, her concern is, rests with the status of the adult demographic in the province who are included in the figure that close to 50% of our population do not have adequate literacy skills um, that permit them to perform more than sort of single uh, uh, focus functions. Um, how, uh, how would you introduce changes that would improve the uh, learning and literacy skills uh, of our adult population? Well, that's a wonderful question. I'm not sure you're aware, but today is a literacy day in New Brunswick. And, you know, I have a very dear friend, uh, the previous Lieutenant Governor, Marilyn Trenholm Council. And uh, this is a, an absolute passion uh, of hers. And the literacy rate in our province is far too high. And obviously this goes to education and our 10 year education plan. And as well, uh, a more emphasis on early childhood education to get, uh, to make sure that our population is, uh, becomes literate and we're doing better, better uh, in that. You know, I believe programs, uh, adult learning, uh, you know, we, we gotta continue to do that at our local colleges, NBCC, for example, uh, have opportunities for people to come in and and you know enhance their enhance their, their reading skills. But I want to just also give you people my thinking on that. Like you know, New Brunswick doesn't have a skilled workforce. We hear we you know we we we're lacking in a skilled uh, workforce. Well, you know, again, my experience over in Europe, you know, the European Union, 550 million people. Um, they have an exchange of any country in the European Union, you can work if you're, if you're from France, you can work in Ireland, if you're Ireland, you can work in the UK, 
there's no barriers to where you, where you can work. So, you know, I've seen countries like, you know, in, in my experience in Ireland where they have agreements with universities in other countries and as graduates graduate, they have a job waiting for them uh, in Ireland. And so we have, you know, if you think of Canada, um, you know, I, I like to think, you know, skilled workforce in Kitchener, Waterloo and Toronto um, and Vancouver, they're New Brunswickers. They just don't realize yet that I'm going to bring them here. And uh, we've got to come up with a unique programs to attract them here, whether that is helping them with their uh, sale of their home or their moving uh, costs to come to our province where we all know the standard of living uh, is much lower, the housing prices are much lower, the beauty of our province, we got to be aggressive in this and I'm convinced with the right type of thinking and promotion and having attractive programs to have people to come here, um, we, we can have those types of programs to reimburse them on the condition that they're going to stay here three to five years, for example. Um, your your 30-day uh, plan mentions a COVID-19 economic recovery task force, and we've already talked about tour the tourism sector, how it's been uh, impacted. Um, once those federal programs expire, as we expect they will, for instance, the emergency wage subsidy, uh, you know, the business account, um, is the province willing, under your government, is, would the province be willing to step up to provide direct financial support to businesses who are still struggling after that period? Absolutely. You know, we all know it's a lot easier to save an existing business than letting that existing business go bankrupt and try to invest and get going new startups or new businesses. Um, we know that, you know, especially small, medium enterprise businesses are about 99% of our economy here in the province. And so we have to do everything. And, you know, we have to remind ourselves, this has been the worst economic contraction, the worst e single economic contraction in our country's history and well as our provincial history. Now you look around and people may say, well, you know, it doesn't seem that bad. Uh, we hear about hardware stores selling out, uh, you know, you can't buy a car, you can't buy a sea uh, uh, you know, everything is, everything is booming. Well, you know, I call that the phony economy. We're on a sugar high right now uh, with mailbox, mailbox money from Ottawa. And as you've rightly pointed out, that's going to dry up. And uh, so look at, we, we have to be there uh, in some form, some shape to whatever ability we, we can provide that uh, assistance. And again, I, I don't see this as government spending. I see this as government investing and investing in our business and small uh, medium enterprise businesses is only smart. Mm -hmm. Just uh, last week, uh, folks at Organogram here in Moncton presented uh, an opportunity which they, they think the province should seize on, and that's to create a regional hub for cannabis uh, research and innovation in the province. Has is, is your party adopted a position on that kind of thing? Look, at, I, I, I'm, I'm well aware of the uh, the the, the uh, initiative in the, in the program and I love it. I absolutely love it. I think it's a, exactly the type of bold thinking that we need. Um, it's it's a, certainly a, a great vision, a great start. You know, people talk about cannabis marijuana and we, we think of, you know, uh, the local retail market here in New Brunswick. But again, when I was over in Europe, 550 million people in Europe and cannabis is becoming more and more and more um, a medication for a whole variety of Ill illnesses from mental health to physical pain. Um, it, it, it is increasingly being used as a medication. And there's a market there. Uh, I can tell you, uh, I know about it, uh, I've seen it. Um, and there's a, an incredible opportunity here for cannabis and the medical um, aspects of that and, and the medication market for cannabis is 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 you know an, another incredible opportunity for us and we've done well in that like we had we were smart we got out in front of this and new brunswick is on the map as 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 we were at one point there in technology uh we're within the cannabis industry new brunswick stands out we got to keep that reputation and build on it 
Um, you've referenced your experiences in Europe and as the ambassador to Ireland. As you may be aware, the, the European Union has made renewable energy a cornerstone of its recovery from COVID-19. Um, would a Liberal government make uh, cleaner energy a cornerstone of our economic recovery? Or do you see that balance between so-called clean energy and some of our more traditional natural resources? Uh, yeah. First of all, I think as much renewable resources that we can get wind, solar, um, hi, you know, hydro with, uh, with, with our tide power, that is the ultimate goal. We should all be striving for that. And uh, it's a big priority for me. I, I talk about it all the time, the green economy and the opportunities for New Brunswick here. But I, I, I'd like to maybe go back a little bit uh, on this initiative of small modular reactors uh, in St. John. We have two companies in St. John, uh, one called ARC, the other one Moltex. Uh, these were companies that um, a previous uh, Liberal government uh, created or got, got invested in. There's been a lot of other private investors in a sense. And you're going to see here within the next several weeks, a huge federal government investment uh, into these initiatives. And, Small modular nuclear reactor, literally the core, can fit on the back of a tractor trailer truck or a shipping container. And one small modular nuclear reactor could keep a medium sized city going for several years. So the opportunity here, when you think of China and India coming on stream with two coal fired electric generation stations every month, and, and, and what's that going to do for our children and their children's uh, future? This is a once in a generation opportunity for our province. We're going to create 10,000 direct jobs and 40,000 indirect jobs. Companies like Craig Manufacturing and Heartland, Sunny Corner Mechanical and Mamashi, MQM and Trackety, um, they're all ideally positioned to manufacture these reactors and to be part of the manufacturing uh, process, uh, creating literally thousands of jobs uh, for New Brunswick. And I believe uh, this is about New Brunswick saving the world. Let me say this again, New Brunswick saving the world against climate change. This is a, a, a dramatic opportunity, a once in a generation oppor opportunity. And, you know, Bill Gates, you know, on the renewable side, you, you know, said, be pragmatic about this. You're never going to get it right as we are today above that 50% supply from renewables, there's going to always be the gap. And we all know the clock's ticking and we've got to get off of fossil fuels. So this is an incredible opportunity for New Brunswick. I'm going to be at the table. I'm going to be at uh, Ottawa constantly on this. I am passionate about it. Um, and the, the danger here for us is that there's only very few places in the world have a social license to develop uh, nuclear technology. Uh, Ontario's one of the other few and we know that the Ontario government uh, is aggressively working with the federal government to invest in those companies there who are developing the same technology. And there's a lot more votes in Ontario than there is in New Brunswick. So this is really gonna take a, a collaborative and open relationship, a good building relationship with Ottawa to make sure New Brunswick maintains its lead on this. And we are leading on this. And, uh, as I say, this is, this is exciting. It, it, it's a game changer for our province. So a, a bit of a follow-up question to that then. Um, a lot of business organizations and business leaders have been calling for, yes, uh, a focus on clean energy, but also the continuation of some responsible natural resource development in, in the province. And it seems in recent years that um, if a project involves natural gas or mining or you, you know, let's talk about the Maritime Iron Project up north, that there just a, a, a government appetite to continue in those projects. Where, where does the Liberal government fall in those? Well, you know, another part of my career careers, I've spent a lot of my life with First Nations people uh, in the Northwest Territories, uh, small First Nations communities, but uh, here in New Brunswick, uh, uh, obviously here in Miramichi, uh, growing up, uh, having interaction at First Nations communities, but I've publicly stated already now, uh, when I become Premier, I will have a First Nations person at my cabinet table, because I strongly believe 
if we're going to go and take New Brunswick forward on these renewable uh, or these uh, resource projects, systems mine, fracking, uh, all these uh, different types of projects that are sitting there, we'll never go anywhere unless we have our First Nations people at the table from the get-go. We got to consult, we got to be, bring, we got to go in there with partners. I went up to Sisson's Mine here because I wanted to see it for myself. And I sat down with the, the, the First Nations people and I asked to meet with the clan mothers because behind the local governance, you have an elderly matriarch group of people that actually make the decisions. You hear from the chiefs, you hear from the councils, but it's a matriarchal group of women that make the decisions. And I sat down with them when I went up there and they told me that I was the first politician ever to come up and see them during the seven mines. And we wonder why we have a problem, can't get systems minds open. It is this in, uh, incredible divide that we've had. And uh, you know, having lived up north, uh, having lived in First Nations communities 10 years of my life, I know that I'm going to bring a big change in resource development in the province by having First Nations people at the table, including a cabinet minister, uh, who will help me and guide me and help us get these important projects off on the road. Okay, there's a, there's a great question in the chat from uh, Mayor Michael Bryan in Fredericton. And it uh, concerns the uh, growing issue of homelessness, especially in downtowns of the major cities. I know it's an issue in Fredericton. It's definitely an issue here in Moncton, and I suspect in St. John. What would your plan be to addressing the, the mental health and addiction issues, which often lead to chronic homelessness? Well, first on the, on the homeless issue, I've already publicly stated and committed that I will do, my government will do whatever it can to eliminate homelessness in Fredericton, Moncton, and our major other uh, centers within four years. Our previous Liberal government signed a $300 million um, deal with Ottawa uh, for the whole issue of homelessness. That money has not been uh, accessed uh, by the, the Higgs government. Um, and within, I, I, I've already said, if you hear this phrase, within the first 30 days, within the first 30 days, I'm definitely going to meet with the stakeholders. Fredericton, Mayor O'Brien, is rising tide in Moncton, I believe is the, the organization in Moncton. And we're going to get going right away uh, and, and building, building uh, uh, and ensuring that we get people off the streets uh, uh, and have a proper home and a place to stay. And I think that's feeds back into the, your, your, your questions about mental health and, and uh, drug addiction. I mean, first and foremost, people have to have a safe home uh, to go to and, and which to, and which to reside. But we all know as well, this has, again, my, my focus on economic development. When you have a homeless situation, downtown Frankton, downtown Moncton, people are just don't want to go down there. Uh, people are not going to go to your business stores or your community stores, your coffee shops, your restaurants, uh, if that problem continues to exist. So this is a, a very important, not only humanitarian issue, it's an economic issue for our local uh, business business operators. So we really, really have to uh, focus on that. Now, getting back into the drug and addiction and uh, mental health issue, uh, a lot of the big problem here now is the evolution of drugs. Crystal methamphetamine is, is a new phenomena. Uh, it's a crisis in many areas. I know my home a city of Miramichi uh, is prevalent, but as well, uh, you know, the other major centers are seeing the effects of crystal methamphetamine, a very cheap, very addictive, uh, very dangerous drug that leads to mental health uh, uh, issues. So with that, we really need a provincial strategy, a, a comprehensive business strategy. I don't believe the judicial system as a police officer and a, uh, and a former uh, member of the RCMP drug section for I guess over a decade of my career was in drugs. I do not believe that the judicial system on some of these issues uh, is the correct tool in the toolbox. There's other toolbox tools that we should be using under different strategic pillars, the prevention uh, pillar. We need to have good education uh, from the, from the get go. This all comes back again to economy and having, making sure that we have economy where people have good jobs and employment opportunities. Um, you know, there's many tools in the toolbox 
other than the enforcement tool, but to send pe people to court for, um, you know, having consumed crystal meth, they're addicted to it, they're released. It's just a never ending circle causing cost and jail time, like overtime costs, uh, all kinds of costs that, uh, that are just ridiculous. So we have to be smart about this. And as I say, I think a provincial strategy to combat um, certainly crystal methyl methamphetamine is something very, very much needed. There's a, there's a follow-up question to Mayor O'Brien's uh, from uh, Andrew LeBlanc at the Atlantic Wellness Center here in, in Moncton. And he asked, what role do you see the nonprofit sector playing in, uh, in a Liberal government's plan to address these issues? How would you engage and support? Yeah. Oh, and absolutely. And, and I, it's a fantastic question. We need to have on all these issues, whether we're talking homelessness, mental health, drug, we need a holistic Approach. We need a community-based approach, um, and obviously uh, bringing and partnering with one another. You know that, uh, that's my campaign slogan: working together. Uh, and we, we, you know, we we definitely have to come together. Government, uh, NGOs, uh, you know, our, our you know your social your ministry of so social services, the police, to address these issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think we've exhausted the questions, but I want to give you, uh, Mr. Vickers, uh, two minutes to sort of sum up and, and tell those on the call essentially why you, why Liberals, what, uh, what makes you distinct from any other party in your ability to lead New Brunswick. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, chers uh, amis, uh, my whole goal of becoming premier of this province is to bring hope and opportunity to our province. And I'm going to do that first by declaring New Brunswick a province of economic opportunity. My goal will be to wherever I can to make investment inviting uh, and to come here. But basically I want to transform our economy. The Kevin Vickers government's main mandate is to transform the economic uh, economy of our province. How are you going to do that, Kevin? Well, I'm going to do that with our people. I'm going to do that with you. And we're going to have specific focus on three trending emerging sectors. One is technology, the green economy, and you've heard me talk already about small modular nuclear reactors. We're going to also focus on our traditional uh, uh, industries such as agriculture, fishing, uh, forestry for sure. And we're going to develop and work with uh, small business operators and whatever we whatever way we can. When I say we robustly go out and identify companies around the world to come to New Brunswick, equally we got to be out around the world finding markets for our small business business enterprises and helping them to find new markets and, and grow. It's by growing the economy, investing in the economy, not cuts and austerities. That's, if I want to differentiate myself between uh, Mr. Blaine Higgs and myself, my path is investment and growth aggressive identification of uh, companies and bringing them here to New Brunswick. I see his path of cuts and austerity, cuts and, austerity and for me, uh, it, that, that is the defining marker between us. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think at, at this time, uh, just to close off the session, I'll call on uh, Ron Gadet, who's the CEO of Economic Development Greater St. John to give us some closing words. Ron? Still on mute, Ron. We'll give him a few minutes to unmute. <laughs> Okay, we'll try this again. Uh, thank you so much, John, and thank you, Mr. Vickers, uh, for participating in this uh, leadership series this morning. Uh, once again, my name is Ron Gadet, uh, CEO of Economic Development Greater St. John. And along with our, uh, the Atlantic Chamber, along with uh, our, our, uh, the Chambers of Moncton, uh, St. John and, and Fredericton, we want to uh, thank you for your, uh, for your time and for your words today. Um, uh, as well, we want to thank um, 
uh, our, my sister organizations, uh, 3 Plus and Ignite. Uh, so thank you uh, so much. Uh, we would also uh, remind people of the upcoming uh, leadership series at uh, uh, 1030 this morning. We have Blaine Higgs. Uh, at 1 p.m. today, we have David Kuhn of the um, Green Party. And tomorrow we have at 9, uh, sorry, 8 a.m., uh, Thomas and McKenzie from the NDP. And at 930, Chris Austin from the People's Alliance Party. So. Once again, thank you so much. And thank you for all of you for participating this morning. We appreciate the time and the very thoughtful and insightful uh, questions. Back to you, John. Thanks very much, Ron. And uh, Mr. Vickers, we did have a couple of late questions. Uh, I don't know whether you'd like to uh, still answer a couple, but I think they're important ones. Um, one relates to uh, the retention of newcomers and uh, the attraction of newcomers to our province. So maybe you'd just like to address uh, where you'd like to take uh, New Brunswick in that respect? Yeah, you know, it, this is critical that we grow our province. Uh, we're an aging uh, province currently is aging quicker than any other province in the country. So we have to target, we have to work with Ottawa collaboratively, have a working relationship with Ottawa to ensure that we have the permits, first of all, to up, up our numbers. Our goal is 10,000 a year. Uh, we'd like to be uh, 100,000 by uh, new arrivals by, by 2030. Um, the retention aspect has been a challenge. Uh, I know, you know, traditionally people come here and then uh, wish to move on to, um, you know, Montreal or uh, Toronto, especially where their ethnic communities are, are, are involved. But I believe, again, uh, the, the answer here, my, my answer here is the economy, the economy, the economy. And uh, if we can get this place going, and I'm confident that we can, uh, and have high paying, good paying jobs, uh, this, this issue will look after itself. Um, and that's my belief. Okay, one last question, I promise. And it's uh, <laughs> one from the, uh, the Capitol Theater here in Moncton uh, asking about what kind of support a liberal government would give to the arts sector? Well, you know, and with COVID-19, you know, it, it, it really, really has been a devastating to the, you know, just by sheer numbers, we, we can't uh, form as we usually did. So look at uh, art is part of who we are. It's the essence of who we are. The culture is, is, is to me is a, a, again, something that we, that makes us mo so rich especially here in New Brunswick, where we have, you know, we have a dynamic Acadian culture, our Anglophone culture. Um, so look at whatever we can do uh, to ensure the survivability of places like Capitol Theatre. We, we have to, like, I mean, we have to come up with, a, you know, hopefully a, a, a vaccination uh, vaccine will come up for COVID-19 so we can return to more normal ways. But uh, that's a real, real uh, challenge for us now. But the government, this is what government does. This is what governments are for. It's, it's in these times of situations where governments have to step up and be there uh, until we're able to cross the bridge to, to, to a better, better way. Thanks very much, Mr. Vickers. And uh, as Ron said, uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, for those of you who are joining us for uh, our next uh, session with uh, Blaine Higgs. You've got a half an hour to get a coffee and uh, take a break and recharge and come back with some uh, equally interesting and challenging questions. So uh, Kevin, on behalf of everyone, thanks very much for joining us. And uh, everybody, don't forget to vote on September the 14th. Bye for now. <laughs>